Well, it's no surprise to Books for Breakfast that a wide-ranging, inventive collection of short stories moving about the place has been so highly anticipated. And it's great news that it's just been published by Blackstaff Press and it's available to buy. So Evelyn Conlon is the author of this collection and we'd like to welcome her to the breakfast table this morning. Evelyn is one of Ireland's most important writers. She was born in County Monaghan. She lives in Dublin. She's the author of four novels and three short story collections. Her work has been widely anthologised and translated. She's also the editor of four anthologies, including Cutting the Night in Two, short stories by Irish women writers, and later on, the Monaghan Bombing Memorial Anthology, which became a centrepiece for a lecture series, The Language of War at the University of Bologna. The title story of her first collection, Taking Scarlet as a Real Colour, has been performed at the Edinburgh Theatre Festival. Her radio essays, they're often heard on the radio, and she teaches writing on Carlo University, Pittsburgh's MFA writing programme. Evelyn's also a member of Estona. Her new collection of short stories, Moving About the Place, which we will soon hear about, she's going to talk to us about it in a few minutes, it's, is a collection which brings together the very best of her work from the last 10 years. Some were previously published in The Stinging Fly and Dubliners 100, 15 new stories which came out from Tramp Press. But it's a collection which also includes a number of new short stories, including, interestingly, I thought anyway, a novella-length story. Peter and myself, we've been thoroughly enjoying moving about the place. It's a vividly imagined, wide ranging collection, which is worldwide in scope and it's fueled by a compelling variety of settings in time and place. These are stories, it has to be said too, that don't shy from addressing important issues of feminism, war and emigration. History, politics, movement, borders, they're also all scrutinised in these brilliantly observed stories and they're often wittily told and they're always highly memorable. So Evelyn Conlon, you are very welcome and congratulations on your collection. We feel very lucky because it's just hot off the press, isn't it? And you must be delighted to have it out. Oh, well, it's, it's it's great to see work, you know, when you can when you've worked on 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 stories for a while, and then the editor comes in, Patsy Horton in this case from Blackstaff, and she sees something in a continuation in the stories that you don't see yourself. So it's it's very interesting to see them actually between the covers and and with a cover on it. <laughs> behind you I can see it there and Evelyn it's true it just gives a new life to them now that they're between covers as you said and not bed covers but a beautiful cover as well and yeah. um, so we thought it'd be lovely though Evelyn to hear you starting off with an excerpt Um, you said you'd love to read from a story called Disturbing Words for Us so if yeah. you want to lead into that Evelyn we'd love to hear the piece you've chosen uh, I'll do that and Disturbing Words is, is a story about 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 border essentially and, and in particular about our border in Ireland, but not just about the border here, but what that effect has. And it's the person who is narrating this story has been affected by the word. For as long as they could remember, my father was a pernicketty sort of man, particularly around language. And my mother seemed to follow suit. Although some of the women weren't sure if the following suit was a sleight of hand. They thought that it might have been her who started it. She was known as a reader. Serious reading hid in her very nerves. She got terribly annoyed about the man who had come walking along here when he was writing a book and had lied about things she had told him. When she brought it up with the women, they could see that it mattered more to her than it did to them. Imagine pretending when there was no need to, she said indignantly as if we wouldn't find out, as if we didn't read on the border. They nodded their heads towards her. She spoke the truth. And now they were gathered, talking their ways through the shock of them both gone. Remember the time he dressed you down for saying UK, someone called to Jerry Moore. And Jerry, who was a perfect mimic, brought my father's voice straight into the room. Let's not get lazy. It's England, or Britain if you want. United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, not around here. And as for an Ulster Scot, that's a Monaghan woman in Edinburgh. Scotch-Irish, that's how it goes. If we mind our language, the rest will follow. And we all stayed quiet in honour of the man who had thought 
that language mattered and the woman who led the sound of truth. My father had been hurt young by the border. The line ran on the top of their ditch. His mother had mourned the loss of her friends from both sides of the house. That's making them from a different country. How can that be? She stopped to think about it some more. So, if you were born in the six counties before now, where will they say you were from? You can't have been from somewhere that never was. She looked out over the imaginary divide as people have always done. That is, people who have lived on border. But you haven't lost them, my grandfather said. You'll just have to go through a checkpoint to see them. You'd soon get tired of that, she said, looking over to the field, third from the window, that would now be in a different country. Yeah, thank you so much, Evelyn. Actually, you know what? It was brilliant when you said you were going to read from that story because it's one of my favourite stories. And you can hear there, it's so distinctive and the ending is absolutely brilliant. I had to chuckle, Evelyn. Oh, I had I, more, I, than, I, I, more than one chuckle reading that story. But... um. So I just wanted to ask you, like, it is such a wide ranging collection. Rome, um, Hiroshima, Australia, Abu Dhabi, Indonesia, Japan, Italy, Scaries, Monhan. They're just some of the places these stories travel to. Um, and the stories are so interesting. They're all so diverse. Um, you know, the man and the woman who travel to the equator because they have this lie that's burdening them that they told during the anti-apartheid days. Uh, there's the woman in Hiroshima who decides to get pregnant because um, after she survived the bomb, there's the Irish woman women's attempt to assassinate Mussolini and these are just some of the wide ranging stories on offer in this collection and we could hear it there in the piece you read all wittily written they kind of cleverly get into the head of the narrator and into the head of the reader and and I felt I was left wanting more which is absolutely brilliant when you finish a story you want to keep going but I was just wondering what sets you off on the journey of a story are there particular triggers for you that start you writing do you think I think I think I think what interests me is well okay that's not how the story goes in the end but there is one thing that begins to be of interest to you. let's say for instance if we take the story about Hiroshima I went to Japan and uh, when I was there I realized okay it's pretty far away I mightn't go back there or I don't know when I would and, and also it was my first time there so I felt that I absolutely had to go to Hiroshima because for me, historically, it would be very odd to go to Japan and not to go there. Okay, that's, that's, that's my interest. Yeah. And when I was there, after I came back, I wrote a non-fiction piece, a piece for the Irish Times. But it never quite, to me, managed to say exactly what I really experienced when I was there. Which was, how could anybody have such hope as to deliberately get pregnant? And I'm saying deliberately, as opposed to just getting pregnant, as in that, you know, it would happen. Like, I think every single thing that was done, every block that was laid in Hiroshima was an act of bravery. Every single thing that any human being did looking forward after Hiroshima was an act of bravery. But that in particular is kind of the most one, because first of all, you don't know what risks you're taking, um, and they must have worried. But so, so then I had to get into the head of the person who might have done that. But then in the end, what I actually do is, is I try to get into the head of somebody who wants to get into the head of that person. And mm. in the end, really, we can't get into the head of that person. Yeah, I know. But it's it's still a very good attempt, Avalon, isn't it? And well, so this, so the, the person experience triggered the story. And then, as you said, you're, you're setting up challenges for yourself as a writer as well, I think, aren't you? Because you're trying to, you're trying to depict something. As you said, the article in the Irish Times didn't quite get there. So then you started again until you felt you got as close to it as you possibly could, maybe, you know. But then I suppose, like a poem, when is a poem ever finished or when is a story ever finished? But um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was there's there's fakers and there's liars in these stories. There's characters who get their comeuppance. And I really like that. I'm thinking of your second story in the book, Two Gallants Getting Caught, where Toby Doyle, a brilliant chancer <laughs> of an academic, he gets made a fool of and dead right to, I think, for his devious ways at the end of the academic conference in Trinity about Joyce but I I don't want to give too much of that story away but do you enjoy writing those kind of witty moments where you almost you catch the characters out um, because of things that they've done (laughs) well yeah you enjoy the minute where you're actually catching them out but there's an awful lot of stuff goes on before you get to that to that point 
So, so I think I think those bits are enjoyable when they're finished. But you can't really begin. You know, that doesn't happen at the beginning of the story. I mean, everybody will know who's an artist or who works at anything that they begin with. I mean, when you're beginning with nothing, it's 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 not the same as what you know. You can tear it apart at the end and try and remember how you put it together, but you can never really remember how you put it together. But that story was in reply to the Joycean story. And I was being very careful to take the wonderful thing which is at the heart of that story of Joyce's, which is essentially about these two, what I think of as boils. Capturing, taking from that woman, taking the work from that woman. So for that reason, that's why I that's why I move it in the way I do. Yeah, it is true. Like you, you sometimes you just don't know where you're going, but but you you go, and then when it's finished, you, are you saying you almost don't even know how you quite did it, but it's finished and it's there, you know? No, I think in a way as well. I think I suppose like everything else, I don't know how other people work so much, but certainly with short stories, I would be taking notes all the time, and um. You know, going back, for instance, to the thing about Hiroshima, although I don't want to spend t- just too much time on that, but, you know, I really wanted to write something about Orador in, in, in France. I mean, when you stand there, what you feel. So, of course, that goes into that story. So, so you know, note-taking, uh, but also thinking about how things link together, which I suppose yeah. we do every day of our lives. Yeah. You know, if you, if you get up in the morning and you read the newspaper first, thing you link together what's happening in the world in a way when you're writing you're linking together uh, things that you have experienced or things that you feel that other people have experienced or and you're trying in a way I mean what you're doing with a short story is you're trying to make sense of the middle bit of the story which in fact as the writer you don't necessarily know yourself because somebody else the reader will tell you you know, and different readers will tell you different things. That story is about such and such. And you're thinking to yourself, no, it's not. But, you know, it's out of your hands then. Yeah, and that's what's so interesting. The book is published now. It's out there. You're going to be getting really varied and interesting responses, maybe as wide ranging as the stories themselves, Evelyn, which would be great. Okay. Um, I wanted yeah. to ask you as well about women set in historical times. Um, Imagine Them is the story of Mary Lee and her daughter Evelyn sailing from Ireland in the 19th century to Australia and Mary's tireless efforts to get South Australian women the vote. Then you have Dear You with Violet Gibson, the Irish woman who tries to shoot Mussolini. I loved the formality of voice, the intricate details of Rome, the politics of Violet's family, the steadfastness of her intentions. If I can just quote a little bit from it, Evelyn, despite the beauty of Rome, despite its paintings, its pencil thin trees rising inexplicably towards the blue skies, its lavish avenues and its bright sunsets, there was a rotting thing growing through that man Mussolini and his followers. So um, did you enjoy writing about these women's lives in different historical settings and what drew you to them now I know that's that's a very long answer Evelyn but if you could just tell us briefly what drew you to uh, them uh, briefly the one about 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 Violet Gibson which I became which I was vaguely aware of but which I really became aware of in fact through a book review I think that Dermot Bolger wrote about Francis Donor Saunders book on Violet Gibson and that's how I came to it first and it stayed in my head extraordinarily said my head. Now, I was sort of quite delighted that, okay, this is going to be a short story, not a novel. And I really just knew that I wanted to get as much of the information about her life as possible, but really try to get inside her head, but also to bring up the notion of what, what does mad mean? And how did this woman end up in an asylum all her life? Yeah. For the entire, until the day she died, which essentially really was about hiding her away. She, she died in Northampton Asylum. And, this, and I begin the story. Finding the way to tell that story was the hardest bit of it, because I was going to tell it from the maid's point of view. I was going to tell it in the third person. I was going to tell it from perhaps a man coming across the story. But in the end, on the day, on the morning when I was out walking, that I came on the notion of the letters, because of all the extraordinary letters she wrote, which were never sent, never posted. Mm-hmm. I thought, ah, 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 that's it. So it's directly between her and me trying to imagine inside her head 
and that one reader who has picked up the bottle and is reading this. So that was the big part of that. And of course, I thoroughly enjoyed trying to imagine it. Now, the Mary Lee one, that story is a different one altogether because I was astounded to find out that the campaigner, like the person who did the most astonishing amount of work, and it was ended up on a commemorative coin in Australia, uh, about the women in the vote in South Australia, which they were second place in the world to get the vote. And she was from Monaghan. She was originally from Monaghan, my own home county. And she had gone to Australia in her late 50s. Her, her husband was dead. Her son was ill. Herself and the daughter, Evelyn, had gone to Australia essentially to, to get the son better, to get her son better, which didn't happen. And then they stayed on. And actually, they stayed on probably because she didn't have the money to come back. Mm -hmm. And then what she did with her life was amazing. Yeah, so, amazing. You know, it's a short story. It's a short, short story. I could have spent a lot more time with her. But I wanted to just get this thing about how does this woman do this? And I also wanted to put her on the map of our consciousness. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, extraordinary, extraordinary yeah. two women, Evelyn. So well done. I yeah. loved those stories. Peter, you want to get in there because I know peter has got loads of questions as well. Uh, I suppose following on from that, um, I mean, one of the striking things about the stories is the importance of of voice in the stories. And a lot of them use first person narrative. And I'm just wondering about the special attraction of this form from you. I mean, that's a very good example of that is the, is the story that you've, you've talked about there, the woman who shot Mussolini, but getting into someone's head and, and sort of telling the story from that point of view. I'm just interested in that. Um, it's funny enough, I suppose I don't really think about it all the time. It kind of comes to me in whatever way it comes. But but the one about 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 Violet Gibson and, and the woman who shot Mussolini. That was different. I, I really had to work on that before I found it as a voice. But when you asked that question, Peter, I suddenly remember going to a poetry reading of Scottish poets. James Kelman, and you'll help me now with the other person's name who might have been there, in the Writer's Centre, Many years ago, when you were in the writer's set. Was it Tom Leonard or was it? A... Hey, that's exactly yeah. who it was. And I remember thinking, so that's a long time ago. I remember thinking, gosh, Scottish, maybe it's poets more than fiction writers, but I'm not too sure. I'll have to check this out now that you've asked the question, Peter. Um, they use the first, first person quite a lot. And I, and I had been sort of veering away from it in many ways. Because there is a danger that people will think that it's you. But now I think that I've got older, I know that's not going to happen. And actually, in a way, I don't care, you know. And even if I, if it's a man speaking, that this is I'm this man speaking, I don't care. Sometimes it's the right thing to do in a story, and sometimes it's not. And it's one of the great freedoms, I think, that the story um, or or you know creative prose, I suppose, offers you. I mean, one thing. I mean, you know, the the Irish short story seems to be very much alive and kicking these days. I mean, there's so many kind of notable collections have come out. I mean, the likes of Louise Kennedy or Daniel McLaughlin. There's Philip O'Kelly, whose book we reviewed on this podcast last week. You've, you know, you've Claire Keegan, A.G. Wivna, many, many others. And I just want, like, um, what is it about the form that's so attractive and what, you know, and that draws so many Irish writers to it? Do you know, do you know, I, I don't know and I don't know in a way I don't know it. And in a way, I don't think they know either. You know, and it's a very dangerous thing to sort of say, but you know, sometimes if you look at somebody playing their own music and you think, okay, I can learn that. I can do that. And then you realize you can't. Now, sometimes you can, but maybe there is a thing about that we have a comfort with the short story because we actually gave it a place within the literary canon and because we did that we therefore ourselves felt that it was something that we were happy to 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 approach and you know sometimes i mean i have heard i have heard a few irish novelists disparaging the short story i have also heard a few irish novelists who then decided to write one and they couldn't but they don't know they couldn't because they actually didn't understand what the short story is who knows what the short story is because in the end of the day, it's just that whiff. It's like, it's, it's, it's 
not you're not sitting down to do to read the 190 pages and 200 pages or whatever you're not going to be you cannot be bored for one second within a novel you can bore the reader briefly uh, you can even bore yourself briefly if you decide listen i'm actually going to describe this tree i mean i know i'm going to lose some people by the end of it but i'm going to do it with any short story, you absolutely cannot bore either the reader or yourself for one second. So it's a very specific art form. And to me, oh, who was it who said, assemble, assemble, assemble everything, something's going to happen. Uh, uh, and that's what a short story really is about, is something has to happen. Now, the happen could be a thought. It doesn't mean that there has to be an event, but something has to happen within a very short space of time. So it's a very specific thing. Yeah. We're all silenced by that. That was brilliant, Evelyn. <laughs> yeah, I think that was so, I was just getting totally absorbed in that and thinking about it. We'll have to continue this conversation on afterwards, Evelyn. But anyway, thanks for that, Evelyn. Um, it's now time for you to rise to the toaster challenge where you're going to talk for two to three minutes about a book that you really like. And um, I, I think Peter's going to count you in. Have you got the toaster there, Peter? And the to- the bread? Yeah, so... Um, I'm going to count you in one, two, three, and off you go, Evelyn. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about and bring your attention to Grace Paley's Enormous Changes at the Last Minute, which is a collection of short stories, one of her three, uh, and, and, and some of the most extraordinary work, I think, that I've ever read. Now, okay, so why is one book more important to you than another? And in a way, it's impossible to say that. Because I would say, for instance, to young writers starting, you must get more than one favourite writer because they might worry that they would be derivative of their favourite writer. If you have 20 favourite writers, you cannot be derivative of 20. You can of one. So in a way, I don't have one favourite writer, but she was one of the most astonishing people that I had ever read simply because she took a politics of the whole of our society and an engagement with those politics and brought it in to the everyday of people and yet it was it is filled with love it's the continuous thing of love of people that has been lost love of people in history love of people i think of it as that um, and i have a i have a strange relationship with the whole thing i found her work in a way i suppose when i was beginning to write properly um, and what was happening in Ireland was not sufficient for what was happening in my brain, I suppose you could say. So I was looking outwards for the writing that meant something to me or that would give me the right to, to, to continue working on the way I wanted to work. Every single writer has to do that. They have to find, they find whatever it is that somehow or another speaks to them personally which then allows them to engage with their own thoughts about how they see the world. Be it the massive world on the day or a single flower, who's to say what? So she was that writer. She was the beginning of that writer. And one of the extraordinary things was that I got a travel grant when Aer Lingus used to do that astonishing thing. They'd give you an airfare and you could go to do something that was essential to your work. And I went to a reading of hers in New York. And... It was a great experience. I met her. We became lifelong friends um, in Graf with, uh, uh, including Peter, uh, uh, Michael Cronin, Barra O'Shea and myself. We managed to get her over to Ireland for a reading. And it still remains one of the most astonishing. If I could just sort of give you, the talk about first line, you would certainly be glad to meet me. I was the lady who appreciated you. But also, in many ways, the short story called Once, which is only about three, four pages long, I think is one of the most extraordinary stories that I've ever read. Because of the way it talks about the ex-husband accuses the wife of not wanting enough. And in the world, we are so used to people wanting too much. So it's just an amazing thing. And it's just slipped in in half a sentence. You didn't want enough. And then, of course, she 
does a list of what she did want. And they're all very big public things. But she didn't want a sailboat. She didn't want the things that he thought it would be appropriate for her to want. She wanted all these other things. So for that reason, and that even even just for that one story, I, I, I think she's one of the most extraordinary writers. Grace Kelly, the Jewish New Yorker. And the funny thing is, she wrote portraits, but I don't believe that the poetry works in the same way as the short stories do. Even though the short stories are actually very poetic, and they're very poetic about the way people's lives and how, you know, how you could deal with disaster and how the dis personal disasters within life have to be put in a context in order to be able to get on with it. And they are, and those are quite poetic and wonderful moments. But yet the poems didn't lift off the page to me the same way. So for that reason, and I think she would love the notion that it was, uh, that there was a toaster being put by both yourself and, uh, and Peter, putting it, putting it forward. Uh, Cause she had a great walk with Peter when she was in Dublin through the city. So Grace Paley, enormous changes at the last minute. One of my very, 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 very best favorites. Oh, thank you, Evelyn. And Evelyn, also, I read a lovely piece by you in the Stringing Fly magazine, where you talk about her as well, and you talk about New York as well, and her bringing the city alive, and that she's never sentimentalised what she says. But Peter, what about that walk with her? What was that like walking through the city with her? I kind of I look back at look back on it slightly guiltily because I, I I must have walked the feet off her. I think I think I nearly wore her out walking her around. Um, Dubbing them and bringing her. I remember bringing her all around the bookshops, and I brought her up to the winding stair and all that as well. And uh, she was kind of charmed by 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 Dublin and the and the yeah. It was we had, ah, it was great, it was great, great, great kind of chats. Told by her great grandfather uh, that the the worst thing in the world you could be in the the worst thing you could be in the world was a socialist Jew under the Tsar, <laughs> unless of course you were Irish under the English. This is when she was a child, so she would keep thinking. What the hell was going on in Ireland? Oh, yeah. More or less, I suspect, also. Where is it? <laughs> but she also told me this amazing story about the Orthodox Jewish community uh, uh, of, of which she had, had, had was descended. Uh, her people had come to America uh, just before the revolution in 1917. But the, the Orthodox Jewish community collected money for Ireland during the famine. And I was thinking, how did they know? in this sort of really distant place. And it's extraordinary, you know, the way news was, was, was given then or whatever. But anyway, that's one of the things. So that was her first visit to Ireland, having had this sentence in her head that her grandfather had said from all those years before. So she loved the walk. <laughs> she loved walking Dublin. So she did she love Dublin, Evelyn? Did she say it was exactly, did she say something like it was exactly as she'd imagined it? Is that what you had said? Yeah. Yeah. Evelyn, that was brilliant talking to you. That was Evelyn Conlon talking to us about Grace Paley's enormous changes at the last minute. I, I'm definitely going to go back and read those stories again. And thanks to, to you too, Evelyn, for coming in to Books for Breakfast and talking about your collection, Moving About the Place, just published by Blackstaff Press. So everybody go out and get get one. It's You're really going to enjoy it. And as usual, all details on Grace Paley and Evelyn Conlon's book will be available on www.booksforbreakfast.com. But we're going to finish today with Evelyn reading an excerpt from another story in this collection. It's a story called Dear You. So we'd love to finish the programme by hearing you, Evelyn, reading that. And thanks again, Evelyn. OK, and thank you both very much. Uh, interesting to have a conversation about books this early in the morning. Terrific. When I was nine years old, my father was made Lord Chancellor of Ireland. I remember all the talk about it. I remember the flurrying of carriages the endless sounds of horses pulling up outside, even at night. I think the boys in the house got more important then, and the girls were expected to do even less than we had done before, but with a lot of dressing up. I didn't attach undeserved seriousness to that, but I went along with it, not knowing what else to do. We had school at home. I particularly liked languages, which were really being taught to my brothers, so they could fight wars if necessary, even where English was not spoken. My French is still good. All our time at boulogne sur mer polished it nicely, and my Italian is a particular love. The Italians still have the best poems. 
we read what we were told to read until I discovered that you could find other books too, some of which I got from Willie. But to get back to my growing up, I did my best to mostly fit in, despite my reading. I occasionally brought up a conversation about women voting. I heard of it sometimes, and my father congratulated himself that he approved. But I knew that he would want to tell us how to do it if it ever did happen. He had a way of looking at me, rather startled, when I mentioned it. The same look he said when he said, enough is enough. I could hear the capitals on the words. And when that day did come, years after he died, I remembered that I asked my sister not to put on a corset just for once. I said to her, oh, for heaven's sake, we're going to vote. And she looked at me like our father used to. I was 50 when I shot Mussolini. A good age, I think, to do it. Don't you? I would really have liked not to have upset everyone, but I couldn't not have done it just to keep my family happy.